Like I said, God has to do something drastic. Satan's not getting it. And you can we can all empathize with this. We have the same problem in our own lives. We have this notion that being superior, because we're not thinking it through, being superior is better than being inferior. That's Satan's own attitude. But it isn't better than being inferior. It's a side, there are two sides of the coin. It isn't better than being inferior. It has its advantages. It also has significant disadvantages. Being inferior is not worse than and not better than being inferior. Being inferior has its own advantages and disadvantages. So synergy is when you combine the two. Christ is God. Father is God. Spirit is God. And I feel real sorry for the people who are anti-Trinitarian. They do not understand the point there. Not good that man should be alone. Not good that God should be alone. It's not just if God were only one person. It's not fair to him that he should be superior and there's nobody else that's the most horrible boring disgusting way to have to live okay you're alone on top of the mountain who can you talk to that's at your level that enjoys things the way you do at your level aren't we all looking for that the essence of a bad marriage or a bad relationship is that the two people don't think the same way. Enough. So, well, God should just be alone on the top of the mountain. Okay, I'm superior to everybody else. Oh, God, how boring. That's true hell. There's nobody you can share your life with at your own level. Ask anybody who's a single parent, and they'll tell you that's not really very fun. It's not fun for two reasons. Number one, kids you know, really need two parents. It's a lot of work. But number two, the ideal way to enjoy parenting is that both parents are doing it together. It's a way for the parents to have fellowship with each other. Two people are married. You got a two, you got multi-dimensional thing going on there. They got their intimacy completely segmented off to themselves. They got their relationship with their periphery, other adults at their level. They got their own jobs. All that stuff impacts the internal relationship between the couple. And they got one more way they can have multidimensional relationship within the couple. Have kids. There is a satisfaction, a fulfillment that can come from that. Okay, but it also puts a strain on the marriage if there's a differential in shared thinking. Same thing is true with friends or any other relationship. It's stupid if everybody else in this life is below you and you got nobody that's on your level to talk to. It's just not enjoyable. Can you do it? Yeah. But it's not enjoyable. So being superior to everybody else has its significant drawbacks. First of all, you're doing all the work. Or most of it. Or a lot of it. You got more work than the guy who's, you know, I'm sorry, but the President of the United States has a harder job than the janitor. Janitor's got his own time. He does it from 9 to 5. He goes home at 5 o'clock and his time is his own. President of the United States never has his, his own time. You see the difference? Superior and inferior. There are advantages to being superior. And all, you know, the peasant attitude is, well, you can just order everybody around. Well, not really. You can ask them to do things. You need to make it a rule. That doesn't mean it's going to get done right. 
primarily because the peasant doesn't know how to do it right. Got to be taught. Got to be provided for. <clears throat> and it's going to kind of resent the fact that he's a peasant all along. So you got all kinds of little problems you got to deal with. On the peasant side, it's not too enjoyable to have this person over you that, you know, can basically, especially in the old days, just order you to be dead. So it's kind of intimidating. Plus, the kind of job you got is kind of, you know, annoying. Very much so. Those are the disadvantages. Okay, but the advantage is that if the person who's superior loves doing his job on behalf of those who are inferior, that's more fulfilling than everything else in life. That's parenting. And the person who's inferior loves getting from the superior. We all really wish, unless we had a really bad childhood, we would like to go back there. For most people, childhood was one of the happiest times of life. We were inferior then. We were getting from other people then. I mean, it kind of depends on what kind of childhood you have. But for a whole lot of people, childhood was more pleasant than adulthood. There is a joy to being inferior. There is a joy to being superior. There are disadvantages and advantages in both. And one of the one of the things that you want kind of almost as importantly or more importantly is you want people of your own understanding, your own level around you. You don't want to be the only one at your level. You don't want to be alone. Not good that God should be alone. Father, Son, and Spirit are constantly giving to each other by means of creation. By means of, do, they're doing for each other. Son is doing for Father. Father is doing for Son. Spirit's doing for Son. <clears throat> through us. Through the angels. Everybody's sharing in this thing. Why? Because God's pouring himself down. It's parenting. He loves it. Satan liked parenting too. But he didn't like being the kid too. Okay, but then he's only getting half the story. He's only getting the joy and the disadvantage of being superior. And he's not getting the joy of being inferior. And all he sees is the disadvantage. You see that picture now. The whole idea of superior and inferior is to have it be the best of both worlds. Okay, but when you're resentful of whatever superiority you got or whatever inferiority you got, then no matter what you get, you can't enjoy it. If you're all nervous about your status vis-a-vis -vis someone else, then no matter what you get, you can't enjoy it. And that was what was Satan's Waterloo. He got to the place, you know, he was like everybody else. We start out in life, we learn all this new stuff, and oh, it's nice, and ooh this, ooh that. Okay, but after you have it for a while, you start to see that there's some problems. Because anything that's finite is going to have limitations. And it really boils down to a question of how much do you enjoy solving the problems? And if you stop enjoying solving the problems, or you stop enjoying even working on the problems, like some guys can sit there and build, go out, they go out and they buy a model ship. Okay? And they'll take extreme care in putting together every little piece of that model to create their little ship of plastic. And it, you can you can spend a whole month doing that. They love doing that. 
I don't. My idea of hell would be to have to do something like that. But that's their idea of heaven. Okay, the idea of being built line on line, precept on precept, was initially fun for Satan. But it became his idea of hell. God building me? Well, but I'm better than all these angels. Something's weird here. Yeah, the weird thing was they stopped enjoying it. Now, when you stop enjoying something that you need to be competent, then what happens? You lose your competence. First, you lose your enjoyment. Second, you start to lose your competence, and it's really fast. So what does God have to do? You have to lose your office. Satan was morning star. In his mind, that's what Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are telling us. In his mind, he started to resent. His first lost enjoyment progressively because of the divergence between him being high over everybody else and him being low compared to God. You can Anybody can empathize with that. Due to the love, he did love God. Probably still does. He couldn't hate him as much as he does if he didn't love him. Hate is always... Um, an expression of love where the person is angry with himself for being in love or loving. If you hate loving, you know, hate and love are two sides of a coin. Love, you enjoy it. Hate, you don't enjoy it, but you're still loving anyhow. Okay, at some point, he lost the enjoyment of God pouring himself into Satan. In those days, he wasn't called Satan. He was Halep. And as that enjoyment diminished and resentment grew because he couldn't resolve the fact that he's inferior to God but superior to everybody else, at some point, he had to project onto God that something was wrong with God so he could feel better about himself. That was the day... It is recorded in Isaiah 14, 12. That was the day that he lost his office. Because that was the day he rebelled. And shaitan means adversary, legal adversary. It literally is the, the opposition lawyer. We say Satan because we don't say shh. In Hebrew, S-H, we turn into an S. I don't know why. Okay, so now he's Satan adversary. Okay, but he was Morning Star. He lost his office. Well, hello. What about the office? It's vacant. He had the office. He rebelled, took a third of the angels with him. And here's this office of Morning Star. Who gets it now? Yeah, well, enter Jesus Christ. In Revelation 2 and Revelation 22, he tells you he got the office. And that's also in Peter. It's usually translated day star in Peter, so you can miss it. So did Gail Ripplinger miss it. She doesn't understand what the story is being told in Isaiah 14. Satan had the title. He was chief over all the angels, and he fell because why? Because he came to resent God pouring him into, pouring himself into Kalel, his old name. So, what does God the Son do? Hi, I'm going to take on humanity, which is even lower than Kalel was. That's Hebrews 2. I'm going to go lower than the angels. And Father's going to do to my humanity what is even worse than what Satan accuses. And that's the story in Psalm 110. And the story in Hebrews plays back to Psalm 110, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 3, and 1 Corinthians 13. Love. A love so great poured into him 
by God the Father, which is Bible doctrine. In those days, the Old Testament, he had to make, go farther than the Mosaic Law, way beyond in his head. He had to take it and parlay it. Because the Mosaic Law didn't pay for sins. That's the whole point that the book of Hebrews is making. The law didn't pay for sins. But Christ did. Manufacturing out from the Old Testament a whole way of thinking. As a result, he stayed sinless. And that manufacturing process was not done by him. He received it from the Holy Spirit, John 7. So what happened inside him while he was here in his humanity beat Satan. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 2, Psalm 110, Hebrews 5, um, Hebrews 7, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 9, and Hebrews 10. So the law was fulfilled and made obsolete. That 728 just flew into my mind, Hebrews 728. This is why Satan was Helal ben Shachar. Satan was Morning Star. Christ beat Satan on the cross. What Satan kept accusing God of doing was saying, Hi, you're just, you know, you're just faking it. I'm actually better than you. You're pouring yourself into us. That's what you say. No, you're just lording it over us. Okay. Bet your contention, Satan, understood. So, hi, I'm God the Son. I'll take on humanity, and I won't use my deity. Nor will I use my humanity to do good. It'll all be done to me. And then you just watch the results, see what happens. See, the cross is a trial victory. Trial victory. God's thinking on trial. Christ's thinking on trial. Hebrews 11, 1. That's tying deliberately back to faith, hope, and love in 1 Corinthians 13. And it's really tying both ends of the chapter. Because the top part of the chapter says, if I don't have love, but I got all the good deeds and even knowledge of Bible on the planet, it doesn't do nothing. And at the bottom... Faith, hope, love. Love, Christ thinking in the head. Christ thinking is what? His attitude toward Bible. What he did with it. Okay, but what he did with it was not his own doing, was it? John 7, the Holy Spirit filled him. And through that process of what happened to him, the Bible coming in his head, Matthew 4, 4. Sustain him on the cross. Isaiah 53, 11. The dato yat through his through knowledge he makes righteous. So that beats Satan. So Christ is morning star. Revelation 2, Revelation 22, another says day star and Peter. He won over Satan. Psalm 110, Hebrews 2. It really Hebrews 1 also. Because that's what starts quoting Psalm 110. You see the point? Christ on trial, Hebrews 11, 1, because he beat Satan. Psalm 110 and Hebrews 2. This is the reason for the changeover of the covenant to church. Christ beat Satan. Christ did what Satan wouldn't do. Christ won the morning star title in his humanity. Now, that's why Hebrews 11, 1 ties back to 1 Corinthians 13 and uses the same words. It's in the pieces, faith, and the 1 Corinthians 13. El piso meno. El piso, jo. That's the end of 1 Corinthians 13. It's el pida. Okay, there Love. Okay, well, the word love is replaced. This is, this is going to be kind of hard to explain. 
The writer of Hebrews uses hypostasis as a nickname for Christ. We call that hypostasis. You know, God-man. Okay? So he's playing off faith, pistis, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, then epizomenon, that's playing off hope, in 1 Corinthians 13. And then instead of using the word love, he uses hypostasis because Paul is talking about the head, which he calls love. And so now, because it's about the joining and, and it's got a lot of things that are funny about it, instead of using the word love, the writer of Hebrews is using the word hypostasis to, to designate Christ. So it's esteem the pistis, a pisomenon, faith, hope. Hypostasis. Instead of the word love, he's using hypostasis, pragmaton. So love is on trial. He's picking it up at 1 Corinthians 13, and he's saying, look, love is on trial. Christ thinking is love. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. The head. What's inside your head? Christ in you the confidence of glory. He just threw that at me. Okay? The glory of being on trial for Christ. But what's on trial? Not what you do. Are you going the same process as he went through? Is his head being built in your head? Christ thinking on trial. It's literally Christ on trial. But like I said, the, the writer's paralleling 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is about the head of Christ. Christ thinking on trial. Elojo suplepomeno, evidence in the trial, unseen. You get that? 